Well, let's continue with prayer. Lord God, the I am by your spirit and in Jesus' name. You are the good father. And as a good father, help us see us as your sons and daughters. That's who we are. Open our hearts and minds to hear that this morning. Open our hearts and minds to hear the truth of your word through this preacher. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, from him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so this is, there's a little bit for everybody in this sermon. So kids, I am so glad that you are here with us. I love that, th- that we do this on fifth Sundays, and you get to be a part of this. And this isn't your time to just check out, because I'm going to be talking to you some too. And so this is, there's something for everybody here. Kids, I want to make sure you have three things, that you have this packet. This is, this is just lots of stuff in it. There's coloring sheets. Um, there's some puzzles. This is for all ages. Kids, I also want to make sure that you have this coloring page that we're going to use in this sermon. So I will tell you how we're going to use that here in just a second. And then you need to have one of these colored envelopes. If you don't have any of these things, kids, they're all back on the children's table right back there, but you'll need them. And I'll, I'll tell you how we're going to do all these things. The title of my message today is Free Indeed. Free Indeed. And so Act one is free indeed. So kids, here's your first picture. It's a picture of a Bible. So what I'm going to do is for each of these pictures, when they come up, there's something I'm going to have you add to it. There's something you're going to draw on it. And then if you want to color it, you can. So here's the first thing. It's a Bible because we start with God's Word. That's what preaching is all about. We look at God's Word. So we're going to start with a verse that's going to be our word for today. But what I want you to draw on this Bible, because even though the Bible tells us so many things, one of the most important things it tells us about is Jesus' love, God's love for us. So draw a heart on your Bible, and then if you want, you can color it, knowing that in the Bible, God tells us, I love you. And those are pretty important words. Super important words, actually. Here's our verse that informs the message today. John 8, 36. There's a lot of context to this verse that would be really great to, to talk about, but it's just, there's just not time for it. So we're going to focus on these words because this is what it really comes down to. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed, meaning there is absolutely no doubt. If the Son has set you free, you are free. You are saved. You don't have to go, I wonder if I am. Am I doing enough? No, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Today is Reformation Sunday. So, This is a depiction of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses on the Castle Church in Wittenberg. It happened on October 31st, 1517, on Halloween. No, it wasn't called Halloween then. But this is kind of seen as the event that started the Protestant Reformation. Now, the Protestant Reformation is a big thing. It's more than Martin Luther. It's... And it changed the world. It wasn't just, I mean, it, it, ha, it impacted the world more than just what it did within the church. It had social impacts as well. It also was happening before this event. This is the event that's kind of seen as the beginning of it that really put things in motion. So that's why we celebrate Reformation Sunday around this time each year. But the Reformation was about. The gospel had sort of been lost. 
The church wasn't preaching the true gospel. There was also corruption. But, that, but when I say the church, I don't mean everyone. The gospel was already, always there. God's gospel transcends our mistakes. Amen? It, it pursues people who are lost. And it always did that. But there are people who were messing it up. So people like Martin Luther were saying, this needs to change. You're teaching things that aren't true. You're adding to the Bible. You're forgetting that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It's as simple as that. So I'm going to say that the Reformation started before this event, even though this is the one we kind of look at. I'm going to go back to Pentecost around 2,000 years ago. We call this the birth of the church. There was a reforming that happened here. These were Jesus' disciples after he had ascended into heaven. And the Holy Spirit came to them in a very unique, profound way. And they had the the flames, the tongues of fire above their head. And they were speaking to people. And they were hearing their own languages from these people that had come from all these other regions. And 3,000 people on that day were baptized and became Christians. There was a reforming of the disciples. This, we call this, again, the beginning of the church. So this was when the Reformation started. But I'm going to go back even earlier because the church is all about Jesus. The Reformation is all about Jesus. So it was started on a Sunday around 2,000 years ago when Jesus rose from the dead. When he completed the work of salvation, started on the cross. We see here, this is a a depiction of him walking on the road to Emmaus with with two men who were reformed that day because they didn't know who he was until he broke the bread and then their eyes were opened and then other witnesses saw Jesus and their eyes were opened. It was when he arose that then all of the people who had followed him finally started getting their eyes fully opened to really understand what his purpose was. They didn't really understand it before then. They believed in him as the Messiah, but they didn't quite get the work that he was really there to do. I'm going to say it started a longer time ago. We've been talking about Moses and the Exodus, and he gave the commandments. God gave Moses the commandments to the people, and this wasn't, it wasn't just about commandments and rules. It was the covenant And it wasn't, this is what you do to earn my favor. It was God saying to the Israelites, I have chosen you as my people. This is who you are and this is how you will live. That's what this was about. It was reforming them from slaves to a people who would bring the light of God to the world around them. But I'm going to say it's even in a longer time ago. Going back to Noah, when the world was reformed, God brought a flood to show sin's no joke to God. He brought horrible judgment on the entire world. But then he reformed it. He, he kept Noah and the animals alive. He saved them on the ark to start over. You want the Reformation even happened a longer time ago. Yes, I am adding errs because it's funny. <laughs> and so we go back to the fall because you didn't really need a Reformation when things were perfect. But Adam and Eve sinned, brought sin into the world. But God, when this happened, set the plan in motion to reform them. They were created in his image, perfect, and they messed it up. And yet God set in the plan to reform us, them, us, anyone who believes into his image once again. Kids, here's your next picture. This is a scale. It's a balance. All right? That that shows you that something weighs more than another. So the thing that's down is heavier than the thing that's up. So here's what I want you to add. Parents, you can help them with this if they need it. God's love is heavier. It weighs more than our sin. 
doesn't mean our sin isn't a burden. It doesn't mean it's not heavy on our hearts. But God's love is even more. He showed it here. This, to me, is the beginning of the Reformation. Genesis 3.15. The promise that God gave after the fall. As he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we see in that picture, we see the wounds on Jesus' feet. As Jesus was wounded. But ultimately, He's crushing the serpent's head. That's what happened at the cross, if you didn't know it. He beat Satan. That's when the victory happened. His death and his resurrection doesn't mean that Satan doesn't have power, but he's now right now a loser with power. Amen. This Reformation promise, this is amazing. It was given in a garden. It was kicked out of the garden, rode on a boat. It was sent to a foreign land, and Abraham walked up a mountain and laid a child on an altar. And that promise was tangled up in a thicket, the ram that would rescue Isaac. It was a promise that betrayed by brothers, sold into slavery, put in prison, a promise that would sit on a throne in Egypt only to be later enslaved by Egypt, a promise placed in a basket on a river and found by a princess when God called Moses to save his people, a promise spread on doorposts, the Lamb of God, saved by the blood of the Lamb. A promise that crossed a dry sea, a sea on dry land. It wandered in the desert, was lifted up in bronze on a pole, the bronze serpent, lifted up just as Jesus would be lifted up to offer life. A promise that conquered Jericho, that wore a crown as kings, but then was conquered and taken into exile, was dispersed. Through all these ups and downs of this biblical and world history, the promise remained. And then the promise was conceived in the womb of a virgin from Nazareth. Was born in a barn and laid in a feeding trough. Promise who physically stood before those who had been waiting on him. All that, all those years I'm glad I live now and I can look back. Man, I, there's a part of me that, what was it like to be the people at that time? Oh my, this is actually him. The promise who fulfilled all things for all eternity, who brought all human existence into one moment on one Good Friday. A promise He sealed in sacrificial love the salvation of all who surrender to the truth of the words. It is finished. He has done it. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It is not on us. Do we have work to do? Yes, we're going to talk about that in a bit. But it starts with our salvation that is not us. It is the Son. Because it was finished when he took all sin to the cross. So there is no doubt. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Kids, here's your next picture. It's a pinky promise. We're thinking about promise. Promise. But what I want you to look at, kids, is look at those pinkies that are crossed. They sort of make a shape. Draw a cross to know that that's the real promise that God gave to his people and kept. And if you want to add this to it, it is finished. For everyone in this room, 
who surrenders to that amazing truth that doesn't require anything of you than to just believe it. It's true for you. It is finished. Act 2, the butterfly effect. This is a monarch caterpillar, if you've never seen this. Uh, my mother raises butterflies, mostly monarchs, but she's got some others in there too. She's got the plants and then collects the caterpillars and protects them until they eat and get fat. The very hungry caterpillars get really fat and then they turn into butterflies. And it's an amazing process to watch. It informs what we're talking about today. So this caterpillar is going to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And then when it's time... It goes and hangs upside down, builds a little web that its tail sticks to so it doesn't fall, hangs in sort of that J shape for a little bit, and maybe a day, half a day, just kind of depends. And then when it's about time to change, notice that second picture, the skin just splits open from the back. And then this thing starts wiggling around. You can kind of see it on the second to the last one. It's because it's flipping all around. And you see that skin, just that old skin, just working up until it falls off. What's amazing about it is it's the same organism. It's not a different creature. It was always a butterfly. But it went through the process of being born from an egg, being the caterpillar, and then going through this change. But we see this change happen, and this chrysalis isn't completely formed yet. This is what it looks like on the left. They get all nice and smooth, and they've got that kind of gold band that really is shiny. And they stay there for a little bit for a few days until as they become the butterfly inside that chrysalis. And it is, you can see the wings they're developing, but now even that part of them becomes clear. And now it's just a shell. And so they break out of that. Their wings are all weird and funky and their body's all fat, but they, they put the fluid in their wings, they let them dry until they fully form. What I love about this, I don't know if this is photoshopped or if they just got a a caterpillar and a butterfly in the same spot, but look at the contrast, and this is why I'm bringing this up. This is the butterfly effect. This is what happens with salvation. We are new. We are reformed. And here's what I want to say about that. That butterfly doesn't care about the caterpillar that it was. It doesn't matter. It's a butterfly now. That caterpillar was stuck on a plant. Couldn't go anywhere. And all it had to do, it it was just eat, 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 eat. But that butterfly can go anywhere. That butterfly can go find its food wherever it wants. A butterfly is a beautiful thing in the world that people see. In fact, some of these monarchs will be able to fly all the way down to Mexico. It's amazing what they can do. Second Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old has passed away. Know that in your heart. Your old has passed away. If the sun has set you free, you are free indeed. Okay, kids, here's your last picture. So on butterfly, you can just write new life because it symbolizes the new life we have in Jesus. And then color that butterfly as colorful as you want. And now, kids, if you want, you can open your envelope. And what you're going to find inside are instructions 
and three pipe cleaners. So what you can do now is make a butterfly as a reminder of this new life. Use your pipe cleaners. It shows you how to do it. We're going to keep going. That's what it'll look like. And then you've got a reminder to take home to remember this new life that we have in Jesus. Act 3, free indeed. All right, I'm going to throw at you some Romanarian freedomology. This is a discipline I'm working on. I'm trying to get in the public uh, colleges. I might have to start with the uh, community colleges. Maybe just some late night fa- Facebook posts. I don't know. <laughs> Romanarian freedomology. Here we go. Kind of sounds like nonsense because it sounds like nonsense, but it's not. And the heart of it is this equation. Death plus slavery plus submission equals freedom. It doesn't make sense. You say that in the world, they go, what? No, I don't think so. But it's true. Let's look at these words from Romans. Romans 6, 1 to 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? If we're saved, if we're forgiven of our sins, so can we just keep sinning? No. That's an offense to God. Why would you do that? You're new. You're made new. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We have died to sin. The old is dead. The old has passed away. So you don't live in it anymore. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. It had, the caterpillar, the, the butterfly can't still be a caterpillar. The caterpillar had to die. Its skin split. It became something new. For one who has died has been set free from sin. This is, I think, in two ways we can see this. When we accept Christ, when we are saved, there is death of the old Adam. There is death of the sinful person that we are because we have forgiveness. There's also a beautiful thing about death. Because then we are free. Those who have died don't have to deal with this stuff. Hallelujah is right. Paul continues, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? No, we're not under the law now. We're under grace. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Don't get hung up on this word slave, thinking of it in the same way that we don't like to think of slavery in this world. This is different. And and culturally, it was different. But this is Paul using this terminology to help understand it's who you belong to. You don't belong to sin anymore. You belong to the Lord. That's what it means to be a slave of righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. We're not slaves of sin anymore. We are free from sin to submit and surrender to what God wants for us. Not on a conditional. Not that if you don't do what God wants, you're not saved. You're not free anymore. Because if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. That remains always. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Belong to the Lord and live that way, is what he's saying. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? This is an example. Don't get caught up. It's just an example he gives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while, she, while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Because she's still married to him. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, there's the word, likewise. He's using an analogy here. My brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. We're no longer in a relationship with sin. We're divorced from it. So that now you may belong to another. It's that belonging. We are in a relationship with God. We are in a relationship with Jesus. We now belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Again, it's not a burden of following God's law. It's a freedom to live the way He calls us to live because our life isn't dependent on how we live. If the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. Now we can respond by following God's law in freedom to do so, not in obligation that that's the only way we can be saved. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed. It's what it makes us free to reform, to not conform, to transform. Romans 12, 1 to 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Not a living sacrifice that earns anything. That sacrifice was there. That's what earned it for all of us. But we can respond. Respond by submitting to the Lord, surrendering to Him, and living our life for Him. And here's some ways that it may look like. We are free indeed. We are free from our past. You are free from your mistakes, from your bitterness or anger. You are free to be different. We are free to live as a child of God, to surrender, to be broken so you can be remade. Got a lot of these. I hope these hit home for some of you. I hope some of them hit home for At least, all of you. We're free to not like the same shows everyone else likes. You're free to get off social media. You are free to give up material desires. You're free to put down the tablet or put the laptop to sleep, to turn off the TV, to put your phone on the charger and leave it there. You're free to spend your money differently. We're free to be pure. We're free to not date. Youth, hear some of these. You're free to not try so hard to fit in. You're free to know that God approves of you. To befriend the person with no friends. You're free to limit time with a friend or friends who distract you from the Lord. 
You're free to lose an argument for the sake of winning a relationship. You're free to forgive the person who wronged you. You're free to admit to someone that you wronged them. You're free to feel forgiven, to know what that is, to have that burden actually lifted off of you to not walk around in that guilt. You're free to pray anytime. You're free to teach your children the truth and protect them from lies. And you're free to ask for help. You're free from anxiety about the future. If you didn't know it, I'm screaming these things to myself. And I hope they're useful for you as well. From placing hope in the plans of man and to trust the plan of God. You're free to leave this life with joy when the Father deems it so. You're free to rejoice for loved ones who leave this life when the Father deems it so. But even in our sadness, we're free to grieve with hope. We're free to be zealous for the Lord, to talk to others about Him, to trust God's long game in this world, to worship the Creator, not the creation, to choose Jesus when it's not popular. Ultimately, you are free, we are free to be a sinner, but not sin. Here's what that means. Free to know that you cannot win your salvation. Free to know that it's not about what we do. I am a sinner, and in that sin, I lay myself before you, God. I look to the cross, the crown of thorns, because this is my only hope. I don't look to myself and beat myself up over who I am, afraid that I'm not good enough for God, because it's not about that. He loves us. His love is greater than our sin. We are free to live in that knowledge that I am not perfect, but He is. And His righteousness is put on me. And therefore, now I am free to not sin. Now I'm free to look at my life and change things. Because I don't have to worry about whether I'm changing it enough. If the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. The takeaway today are these two ideas You're free, free by the gospel. It's different. We're the butterfly. We can shed the old skin. We can fly. We are free to go and follow the Lord in all the ways we feel called to do so. Whatever way that may look in your life, we are free to be light to the world. We are free to not conform to the world. We are free to not look like the world, but be the light among it, pointing to the cross. Amen. Now may the peace of God, that which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, the I am, by your spirit and in Jesus' name, work on our hearts this morning. Work on our hearts tomorrow, the next day, each day. Let your presence be known. Call us to you. Help us come to you to hear your words and to let your living word change our life. In Jesus' name, amen.